for being here. Absolutely. You you are making it hard for us for your successor, you know. Yeah. I'm trying. This is a pretty pretty good consecutive streak going. Yep. We did our best to we we did our best to get rid of that streak, but we, you know, try as we might, we couldn't. Well, I'm not I'm I'm not trying to jinx it because I know it isn't in black and white yet. So I won't I won't speak too much more to it until I see it in black and white. Yeah, yeah good. All right, uh, Charlie, I hope you're back around. I think we have enough noses, do we not? Did you count our noses? I can't hear you, but he's counting out loud. Yeah, I'm doing a quick count. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you are good. All right, so we'll call the... Uh, November 15th meeting of uh, the CCRPC to order here at 600. Oh, um, and we'll see if there are any changes to the agenda. I'm going to bring your attention. Well, first, I want to welcome the auditors, Kyle Connors and Andrew Koopa, if you're wondering. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, so if you're wondering who those faces are that are popping up. But I want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that we have on the consent agenda, three items, the minor tip amendment for South Burlington's uh, Hinesburg Road. It looks like a path, a Winooski tactical basin letter, and uh, that it's in conformance, and a the minutes of October 18th. So since we've put the minutes now on the consent agenda, if anybody would like to make any edits uh, to those minutes, we would have to take it off the consent agenda and then hear about that separately. So we had agreed to that last month at our meeting. And with that in mind, I'm going to ask for any changes uh, to the agenda. Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to item two, public comment. Is anyone here from the public who would like to speak to a matter that is not on the agenda? Hearing and seeing none. We will move to action on the consent agenda. We actually have um, 3A first, a minor tip amendment. And as recording we were, in progress. As we were hearing uh, in our training this past hour from five to six o'clock, uh, it's an MPO action. So as an MPO action, we need votes from, I believe, uh, all the municipalities and VTRANS, but not fuel score. Is that correct, Charlie? All right, so our regional our regional partners, and I'm trying to find the right language for the other uh, representatives. Yeah. yeah, the other regional members also don't have a vote on MPO. Business. The transportation, uh, the other transportation members don't have a vote on it either. But we do have. The or do the other at large members? Right. Okay, great. So with that in mind, uh, I'll, can we? How do we group this? So do we just three A? And then 3B and C together, Charlie? All right. So yeah, that I'll would need... work. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll need a motion for 3A on the consent agenda. Motion for 3A. Thank, thank you, Andy. Yeah. And second from? Second. Thank you, Elaine. So uh, 3A, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining, please speak up. I'm abstaining. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to move to um, 3B and C. Um, so we need a motion to approve 3B and 3C on the consent agenda. Thank you, Garrett. And a second from Catherine, was it? Yep, that sounds Thank good. You. All those in favor, please say aye. I do have Raise a your... change to request. <laughs> we have to remove whatever you want to change off the consent agenda. We have to move that. Is it to the minutes, Garrett? No, to the tactical basin, just that uh, missed a community in the letter saying so that. It... That would be important. Um, <laughs> let's back up again. and uh, I move, move. We remove the letter to the tactical basin plan, conformance with the eco plan item, which is on the consent agenda, off the consent agenda. Is that okay with you, Garrett? Sure. Thank you. And Catherine. Sure. Okay. So all those in Just favor. Just put on please. the minutes. <laughs> all those in favor of removal of the B, 3B, please say aye. 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 
All Anyone right. opposed to abstaining? Please speak up. All right. Uh, before we get to 3B, uh, we're going to move to 3C, uh, where your motion, I believe, is still in order, Garrett, and your second is still in order, Catherine. Yes. Uh, so all those in favor of the minutes of October 18th, although uh, in the agenda it's listed as 2024, I hope I didn't check the title of it on our thing, but it should be 2023. We haven't gotten that far ahead. Yes, it is 2023. So good. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 And anyone opposed or abstaining, please speak up. I'm abstaining. Thank you, Karen. Okay. So, uh, Let's move to uh, item 3B, and uh, I'll need to hear what the issue, and I need a motion to approve it, but you apparently want to amend it, Karen. Um, I would approve with, I would move to approve with the addition of Buell's Gore. Huntington's included because the Huntington flows in, Huntington River flows into the Winooski, and um, half the headwaters of the Huntington uh, start in the Gore. Does uh, anyone have second that? I will. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Ben, 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 Benjamin was first, actually. <laughs> What's that? I said Benjamin was first. Perfectly <laughs> fine. Chivalry, not chauvinism. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone wish to discuss this further? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye or raise aye. your hands. And anyone opposed uh, or abstaining, please speak up. Okay, we will move on thank to... Thank you. Thank you, uh, Garrett. Point that out. Um, the number four, item number four, the draft fiscal year 2023 audit. And I assume that will be Forrest and uh, Mrs. Connors and Koopa. Yeah, indeed. Um like to introduce Kyle Connors and Andrew Koopa from Markham LLP. Uh, this is our first year of engagement with them after a, a long stint with our previous auditor. And um, I'd like to thank them for being here tonight and for having a draft of the audit report to present to us. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, gentlemen. And I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, Kyle Connors, I'm a partner uh, with Markham out of our Providence office. And Andrew Krupa, who's here with me today, is a supervisor out of our office. Um, so as Forrest uh, noted, this is our first year working with the commission. Uh, happy to have a draft available today to share with you. Um, but really, that's a that's a byproduct of uh, starting with your, your prior year auditors who were uh, more than friendly with us, uh, worked great with us, provided us with everything we needed. So um, thank you to them. Um, and then to Forrest and Charlie for being unbelievably responsive, uh, getting us the request that we asked for. Uh, certainly, uh, this financial statement draft being available, is just a byproduct of the, their hard work and uh, responsiveness. So a big thank you to the two of them as well. Um, so I'm happy to walk through the financial statements. I'm going to go over some of the areas that I think are, are important and key for you um, as the uh, commission board members. Certainly, if there's an area that I um, skip over, or if there's something that you want to bring up, um, or any questions along the way, I'm happy to help answer them. Enforced, I, do I have the ability to share my screen for this? I hope so. Let's find out. It appears that you do, Kyle. Fantastic. So everyone can see my screen before I start diving into things? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, so the first thing that you'll read as you get into these financial statements is that we are, um, well, we certainly haven't issued, but um, upon approval and then through our quality control process, are issuing a clean audit opinion. Uh, what that means is that, oh, you know what? I shared the wrong screen. Let me try that again. I was showing you last year's financial statements. You don't want to see those. You want to see this year's. Moving on. All right. Uh, so, yeah, issuing a clean opinion. Um, we really only had an entry or two, uh, very limited. So hopefully what that means is on a month-to-month -month basis when you're receiving financial packages um, for your board meetings that they're reliable. Um, so I'll jump right into the uh, finances and the, and the, the results. 
So the commission finished the year with a uh, very small deficit of just over $3,000. But that's really a byproduct of a couple of GASB standards that don't directly impact your uh, your operations. Uh, the, the lease standard, which uh, was put into play last year, as well as the GASB 68 pension um, plan, the VMERS plan, that I'll get into plenty of detail on as we get through this. So, you know, exclu excluding those items, um, the the commission had a surplus in operating income of just over $91,000 uh, in the current year. It's a byproduct of a couple of things, uh, specifically the financial performance, staff hitting revenue targets, um, grants increasing a bit um, year over year, as well as the um, you know ability to retain your membership dues um, year over year as well. Also, I think when you know when budgets are putting to get being put together year over year, uh, it's really a, a challenging thing to predict what the indirect cost rate is going to inevitably be. And so, for fiscal twenty three, that rate was budgeted for at seventy six point eight percent, and ended up coming in at seventy six point nine five percent, which is um, incredible. And I think an a testament to uh, clean financial reporting and 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 you know, focusing on areas that are uh, important during the budget process. Commission has a goal to maintain a reserve of 3X your uh, non-project operating expenses. That reserve was maintained at a little over 410,000 at June 30, 2023. Uh, 3X your operating costs are about 633,000. So whilst not certain, uh, certainly not 100% at the the goal, and with the goalpost always moving as those uh, monthly expenses go up over time, um, certainly good to have a reserve. Um, ultimately, your your budget model is set up for grant reimbursements and not necessarily to to grow a significant uh, net position. But um, you never know what's going to what's going to happen, and having that reserve is is critical for the uh, commission's long term success. This is a comparison of the statement in that position, um, also known as the balance sheet. And ultimately, the commission ended with $131,000 of total net position. Um, you know, Forrest had a, let me know that it's important for the board to understand what that means pre and post the Gatsby 68, your pension, uh, your VMERS activities for the year. And so we've included a balance sheet of what that would look like without the VMERS plan involved. And ultimately, it has an impact on your total net position of about 688000 And why I think it's really important for you to understand the difference between the two is that, you know, the, the liability that, that's associated with that net pension plan was a little bit over $1.1 million. And while there are benefits that are being paid out to retirees under that plan, that liability is not going to come to fruition within the next year. Um, that's just a projected number that's going to be paid out over the next 30 years or so. Um, and it's always shifting based off of um, investment activity. It's shifting based off of the state's uh, uh, estimates, what they think the market's going to work at, uh, life expectancy. So there's a multitude of factors that go into that VMERS plan. And I think it's critical to note that you know, it's not you're not going to come to fruition and the commission's not going to have to shell out that 1.1 million dollars next year it's more of a project projection um also vmers is going to tell you what the commission's um liability is there's not really an over an, an ability to overfund it you know tell you what your liability is they tell you what the, your contribution is it's the commission's responsibility to make that contribution um but if you wanted to contribute more to reduce that liability um that's just not how the state plan works. So you're kind of um, at the mercy of the plan and, and whatever liability figure they provide at year end is, is um, what you end up with. And I'll kind of go through and show you what that's looked like year over year uh, as we get further into the financial statements. Focusing on operating revenues and expenses, uh, both of them went up quite a bit. Those are typically going up hand in hand uh, with the project revenue. Uh, grants in grant match revenue uh, compared to the project costs. I think project costs out of the four hundred or out of the five hundred and eighty-five thousand dollar increase year over year, 
about 400,000 of that made up uh, project expenditures. Uh, the rest of that is increases in uh, salary and related payroll um, and some other items. Apologies, I left some uh, some notes for myself, but I can't seem to find them. Overall, the commission had about 4.7 million in grants. And I think it's important that this note gets shown in the financial statements. While it's not necessarily required under Gatsby statements to share this, um, the commission does choose to. And I think it's great for the reader of the financial statements to get an understanding of uh, whether the, the grant funding is coming in direct federal, uh, whether it's passed through the state and through what programs. Um, and so this is a an important detailed note for, for the board to review. So we were talking about the, the VMERS plan. And it, it's very interesting to look at uh, the liability that's associated with the commission at 1.1 million at year end. They are anticipating that the state's plan assets will work at 7% year over year. That's what's called the discount rate. But if you note, if the plans work, if the assets work a little better, right? Better investments of a better year of, of the market, just by 1%, it drastically changes what the commission's liability is in, in same in reverse. Um, so we see big swings in what this number ends up being just based off of investment performance year over year. So I actually found an error in this as I was uh, reviewing it prior to our presentation. Um, so this uh, proportionate share of net pension liability is not 338,000. It's 1.1 million as we just reviewed. Um, but you can see that, you know, the way that the, the market's gone, the plan was funded at 86% last year. It dropped down to a poor year um, economically to 73% funded. Um, and so you you would see that liability jump up from... 550,000 to the 1.1 1 .1, and that's really what drives what drives the number that that correction will be made prior to uh, issuance again vmers is going to tell you what your contribution requirement is you know you can see based on this the, uh, the last 9 years the commission has uh, been given a required contribution and has made that required contribution uh, fully I think one of the more critical areas to look at, and I apologize if it's small, small text on your screen, um, hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to at least take a look, is your budget versus actual. Obviously, um, pretty significant swings in two areas, uh, project income, grant income, and the um, contract services. For the most part, these really net to zero. Um, and are, are challenging to budget for um, on a year-to-year -year basis uh, without fully knowing exactly what projects are going to come to fruition, what grants are going to be available. Um, but we would not expect to see revenue significantly higher than what this line, or the, you know, the variance to be higher or lower than this line here. They, they really do go on a cost reimbursement basis. So even if revenue didn't come uh, you know, in, in line with what was budgeted, the, the correlating contract services also didn't, so they they wash out. Uh, for the most part though, everything else was relatively close to what was budgeted for. Um, I don't really have anything material to note that was an outlier. We, uh, we talked about the calculated indirect cost rate, what was budgeted for and what came in. Um, this is a nice schedule that provides a little bit more detail for those interested in, in seeing uh, what those projections looked like uh, versus what they came to be. Um, that's really all I had for as far as presentation goes, but I'm more than happy to answer any any questions that you might have for us. Folks, anyone want to bubble up? Doesn't sound like anybody wants to dig into the numbers yet, Kyle. And this is a draft, correct? Yeah, so this is a draft. Um, you know, we've been working pretty hard for the last uh, three, three and a half, four weeks to get this, uh, have this available. But as Forrest alluded to before we jumped on, um, what this is not including is the single audit section. 
Um, the single audit section will discuss uh, will discuss two important areas. It'll discuss our internal controls uh, review, which is part of the Yellow Book report. Um, we've spent a significant amount of time pouring through the uh, commission's internal controls over payroll, over cash receipts, disbursements, and significant transaction cycles. Um, and we would include in that single audit report findings if we had any. Um, I'm happy to note that we don't have any internal control findings to report. Um, however, we've not gone through the um, we've not gone through the single audit, the compliance piece yet. So we can't say one way or another if there's going to be a compliance issue. Um, the compliance piece is raised is um, is due March 31st, whereas the financial statement piece, I believe, is due uh, by year end. So um, we wanted to make sure we focused on issuing the one report, uh, the financial statements in time for their deadline. And um, we're going to move right into the single audit as soon as we get an opportunity to. Um, we, if as far as recommendations go, um, I think the one thing we would focus on is cybersecurity, uh, making sure that um, the commission does have a formal cybersecurity plan in place. We've seen a lot of entities uh, reach out to cybersecurity insurance providers and having them perform penetration tests uh, to make sure that you're covered. Um, we see it all the time, towns, uh, entities like, like yourselves who feel like they're comfortable with their um, their IT systems. Uh, they, don't, they don't feel there's any vulnerability. Uh, next thing you know, there's a malware or a ransomware attack. So it's just something we're, we're seeing a lot. Um, we did walk through the internal controls of the I, IT department um, and felt they were there were there were no findings to bring to your attention. But always recommending additional layers for cybersecurity in this day and age. And I, I did see a couple of hands come up. So if... yeah, Charlie was up, and then uh, Jeff. But Charlie, I guess you drew back. Yes. Okay. So Jeff, go ahead. Had to get off mute, <laughs> which is hard for me sometimes. Um, this new fictitious calculation that you have to explain, I mean, these new GASB accounting standards, um, just for a point of information, could you let us know what the feeling was, what we're showing by making this implied interest calculation for amortizing the entire length of time for our lease, even though the only thing that's applicable to what's going on is the next 12 months in terms of our budgeting and in terms of our financial statements. It it, it seems like it's the GASB suggested change du jour or du year, I guess. Yeah, they. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and it's a, it's a good point. Um, they've really been putting me through the ringer these last few years. Um, and there was a new one this year for GASB 96, which ended up not being applicable uh, for the commission, but that was nearly one that we had to implement as well. Um, yeah, they, they've they really been following. So FASB, which is, you know, uh, for, for profit accounting came out with um, with 842, which is their least standard. And GASB seems to want to follow what FASB is doing. And so they came out with 87 last year and, and made you accrue your entire, uh, what would have been an operating lease. Uh, for your office space. And so um, I know that added a layer of difficulty when it came time to reviewing and understanding the financial ramifications. Um, is there a specific question on 87? What are they trying to transmit to the consumers of our uh, of our financial statements? If we've got to spend half the time that you're presenting the audit explaining why it really doesn't apply and why the number that appears in our audit um, needs to be interpreted a different way than a normal person would interpret it. Yeah, no, right. I, I, we're all sort of at the mercy. Uh, we're at the mercy of, of GASB. Um, I think their, their intention was because uh, the, the least standard was two sides. Um, only one side was applicable to the commission. The other side is, you know, if you have like a cell tower lease or something like that, that you're making revenue off of, you should capture that receivable and, and show to the reader what you're going to get over time. So the the flip side of that, um, which I think is a little bit less helpful, is the right of use asset, which, you know, you, you're depreciating, you're amortizing that that office space over the life of, of your lease. Um to answer your questions, I you know I, I wish I did, I wish it wasn't a thing, uh, but we're we are at the mercy of of eighty seven and and showing it in the financial statements. Where I think it's really critical for the board to focus on 
while I understand your question and I understand the frustration, is this budget to actual, which I think is really the the year to year focus that you're talking about. Well, I mean, in some cases, I could make an argument that it's good to have a long term lease. <laughs> that we don't get jerked around. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But Right. It, rather than going month, you know, or year to year and in, in not knowing what your rent is going to be. But as soon as that long term event triggers, the, the standard kind of sucks it up and I makes understand. it count I, for I, it. I understand. It's the it's the same thing with you having to go through the explanation on um our uh pension liability when it changes every year based on what the actuaries say. And the only thing that really is of material to what it is that we're doing here is we recognize we have a long-term liability, but we also have a funding stream that can be uh, tapped to do that, which we don't know what it is right now, yet we're trying to estimate the next 20 some odd or 30 years of our liability without even considering the fact that there will be some source of revenue there. And so it makes us look worse than what we really are. And I just I don't get the point. You could do a footnote without gumming it up with made up numbers, to be honest with you. That's and that's what we have to do. I understand under this, but it just, you know, when does the governing accounting board stop pulling everybody through knot holes when all we do is explain to everybody how, well, don't really pay attention to that. It's just what they're making us do. Sure. No, I can I can sense and understand the frustration, believe me. I mean, we did try to add some some flavor to the management's discussion and analysis to kind of show what it looks like without the plan. But I understand the frustration of having to do that in the first place. Yeah. And and the finance committee and the executive committee have heard me bang the table over this for the last two years. So sure. Just... And let let let's hear from Charlie then, and hope that you guys can have a beer afterwards and uh, go deeper on the subject. <laughs> I got uh, three things. Um, one, uh, first, uh, my great appreciation to uh, Forrest and Amy and Mackenzie for uh, getting us to this place and, and for the auditors. Thank you, Kyle and Adam, for reviewing all, all of our work. Appreciate it. Um, secondly, just a process point uh, to highlight for the board. Um, note that this is, uh, this is kind of a, a draft action item, but it's not Fully and Kyle, if I understood, this isn't really the final version of the audit, right? So we're going to get a, a final version sometime in the next week or two. That's the plan, correct. Yeah. And so um, traditionally, we've had the executive committee and finance committee review this at a meeting, draft, and then you see the final. Um, given the timing this year, I'm hoping that the board is okay kind of... Uh, deferring uh, acceptance of the audit to the executive committee on your behalf and uh, with the finance committee uh, meeting in their first uh, early, I can't remember what day that it, maybe December 6th or, or something like that. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping you're okay. And uh, maybe that would be the action to recommend to the board that you're, uh, you're uh, authorizing the executive committee to accept the audit on, your, on the full board's behalf. Um, so that's a placeholder there. And then third, I just, um, and this is a little bit longer term, but looking forward into FY25, you know, I, I think it's pretty striking to note that like about $2.5 million that was in our budget, but has not come through in FY23. Um, that is telling me that there's kind of $2.5 million worth of work that is kind of on our plate in FY24, in addition to the FY24 money, right? Um, and so just this, this is a little bit of a heads up for the springtime. And for those of you on the UPWP committee, um, thank you, Bard, for leading that. Um, <laughs> and, but I think for the first time that we're probably going to have to take a harder look at how many projects we're able to fund more realistically for next year just to try to give ourselves a little bit of capacity to chew through what feels like now it's like a $2.5 million, I'm, I'm afraid to call it backlog, but, um, or just amount of work that's on our plate. Um, so just, just a heads up that we may not be able to be as accommodating as we have uh, really tried to be over the past years um, in order to kind of work through some of the work that's on our plate. Sorry, not necessarily audit related, but that $2.5 million um, of under budget is really 
uh, was kind of striking. And, and is hanging over us for next year. So, right. It, it was, it's this year, right? And we don't want to compound it by making more promises than we can deliver in FY25. So, uh, the action item again, Charlie? So, yeah. I will make a motion. I will move that the commission accept the audit contingent upon final approval by the executive committee and the finance committee on the single audit language and that there be no material differences reported between the draft audit and the final audit that we've reviewed tonight as a commission. And a second. I'll take Garrett. Thank you. And uh, any further discussion? Any thoughts from Forrest? Just hopefully I'm not muted. I'm not. Um, just big thanks again to Kyle and uh, Andrew. And um, yeah, looking forward to getting the final draft. So, yeah. and, and thanks to the staff, those of you who know I say this a lot, but this is another apparently clean audit pending the final audit. And it wasn't always this way. So thanks to our financial team and Kyle and Andrew, the only reason you heard me whining about that stuff is you guys are part of a big organization that can have an impact on some of this stuff. I think Gasby needs to understand the practical effects of when they come send something down from the mountain and what it does to small organizations like this. You're, you're tasked with taking those thoughts back to the tower and uh, <laughs> launching at them. <laughs> well, um, all those in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 And anyone opposed or abstaining, please uh, speak up. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, item five. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Messrs. Connor and Cupa, and enjoy yeah. your evening. Thank you, too. Uh, the um, transit performance measures and targets. Uh, who's Yeah, to... so I'm just going to just say a few words. I want to welcome John Moore and Matt Kimball, um, GMT. They're going to be talking about the transit performance measures and targets. Um, this is part of our coordination. Um, John and Matt talked to the PTAC about all of this, like the beginning of the month, and now they're coming to the board. Um, and again, this is a part of our uh, kind of requirements from FTA and FHWA to coordinate on setting up, uh, you know, measures and well targets uh, on established measures. So. John and Matt, take it over. Um, I think, Matt, are you going to just share your screen? Yes, yeah. that, that was the plan. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can you see my screen, the PowerPoint presentation? Okay. Yes. So this is our presentation. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Eleni, uh, on our transit asset management and public transportation uh, agency safety plans. So we'll start with uh, transit asset management. And um, to start a uh, broad overview on what transit asset management is. So that is um, that is how we outline our practice of assessing, monitoring, and reporting the condition of our assets that we use in the provision of public transportation services. It's an FTA requirement for us to uh, adopt and maintain a transit asset management plan. Uh, additionally, it also helps us with uh, informing our strategic planning of the replacement of our assets, which includes the procurement uh, operation and maintenance of those assets, which um, aids us in uh, managing uh, costs and performance over the life cycles of all of our assets uh, in our mission to provide safe, cost-effective, and reliable public transportation. So uh, a bit on what transit asset management can offer us. Uh, it helps us with reducing our risk and improving safety. Uh, we, by keeping our assets in a state of good repair, that helps us with reducing the risk of catastrophic failures, which can lead to accidents and injuries. Also, it helps us support more effective operations. Uh, the increased breakdowns of critical equipment will lead to backlogs in, in maintenance needs, as well as delays in meeting our service obligations. And the proactive replacement of our assets keeps them in, uh, which support our cr critical business functions, uh, keep them in work, good working order, which helps us with improving the efficiency of our operations. 
Additionally, it helps us with improving reliability of our operations as well as uh, customer service. So by uh, the increased volume and frequency of asset breakdowns would lead to uh, service delays and lost trips. So by having a more proactive replacement approach, we can reduce those uh, frequencies and improve our service model. And uh, also by improving the condition and cleanliness of our stations and, and vehicles, that will help with improving the customer experience uh, on our while accessing our transportation system. And finally, it helps us with saving time, money, and resources. The operation and maintenance costs of assets increase significantly when assets are extended beyond their life cycle, their expected life cycles. And uh, sustainable replacement of our assets aid us in future planning and balancing our capital investment needs in each year. And uh, reducing the life cycle costs, uh, we we see a reduction of life cycle costs when assets are when asset replacements are aligned with their expected use cycles. Some of the requirements of uh, of TAM as as governed by the FTA, uh, first and foremost, we we're uh, required to create, maintain, and update a uh, compliant TAM plan uh, in compliance with FTA requirements. Uh, as Eleni said, we we uh, coordinate uh, the adoption of this TAM plan and the and the uh, development of of tr uh, uh, performance targets with state and regional planning agencies. Uh, we self-certify our compliance uh, during our annual certifications and, and assurances and the development of our federal and state grant agreements. We submit data uh, to the FTA through the NTD reporting process, and the data that we report on are our performance targets, uh, the performance status, which includes our condition assessments and our inventory of our assets, and uh, we also submit an annual narrative report on how well we uh, meet our performance targets in a given year as part of that NTD reporting process. And then finally, we participate in oversight uh, of our transit of our TAM plan uh, during triennial review and state management reviews. The performance targets that are set in our TAM plan are in uh, three overarching categories. Uh, rolling stock, which is our uh, primarily buses, but any revenue service vehicle that is used primarily in passenger transport, which can include uh, smaller paratransit vans and minivans uh, used in demand response uh, transportation services. And the performance target for, for that category is primarily set by age. Uh, additionally, we have equipment, which are primarily uh, non-revenue vehicles and maintenance vehicles uh, used for our maintenance operations, as well as driver relief uh, and our uh, operation supervisors, um, also uh, dictated or targets set by age. And then finally, our facilities, which are broken into two, into two subgroups. We have our uh, administrative and operation facilities, which we have two of in the Burlington area. Uh, as well as a passenger facility, which is our downtown transit center uh, on Cherry Street in Burlington. And uh, performance targets are set by a uh, condition rating uh, using the term scale, which I will uh, define on the next slide. And uh, there's a, a set, uh, set uh, process for evaluating condition for facilities uh, dictated by the FTA, which I'll also go into in more detail. So on this slide, we have a few charts here. I'll, I'll explain uh, each one. Uh, we have our performance targets and measures from uh, between 2023 and 2026, which is the performance period of our current TAM plan. And uh, as you'll see, we, we have these broken up into the categories I mentioned earlier, as well as a deeper dive in the different types of revenue vehicles that we have. Uh, the percentages that you see here are the percentage of assets in each category that are at or in exceeding their useful life. So the lower the number, the better uh, in our performance or uh, in meeting our performance obligations. And uh, as I said, uh, our targets currently are set by age and we use we use the FTA standard uh, useful life for the age of our assets. 
So our larger uh, transit buses that you see on the road in Burlington, the 35 and 40 foot buses, uh, those have a 12 year useful life. Our smaller cutaway vehicles, such as the ones that we lease to SSTA for paratransit service, those have a five, five year or seven year uh, useful life. And then vans and minivans have a four year useful life. Uh, there is some some leeway in uh, determining the uh, the useful life, but those are mandatory minimums uh, set by the FTA uh, because of the climate in Vermont. We do not expect to be able to end in past, past prior experience uh, extending beyond those useful life uh, benchmarks is infeasible and and leads to those increased maintenance and and uh, reliability issues that I outlined in previous slides. Um, and uh, in the lower right, you'll see a couple, of, you'll see a table there. That is what I refer to when I say the term rating scale. Uh, it's a rating scale uh, developed by the FTA, uh, one, uh, one point to five point rating scale. And our uh, performance target for our facilities is to have all of them be at least a 3.0 on the term rating scale. And the way that facilities are evaluated are by breaking down the facility into different subcomponents, uh, such as the foundation, the shell, uh, structure, uh, major systems such as your HVAC, uh, conveyances like elevators. Um, looking at all of those, rating them uh, separately, and then having a weighted rating system to develop the, the scoring there. And so we, you'll see we have one facility, our uh, storage and maintenance building uh, next to our main facility that is below a 3.0 on our uh, term rating scale at the moment. Okay, that was, uh, that was it on the uh, TAM plan. I can turn it over to John for the safety plan, or, but if there are any questions at this time on the, on the TAM performance measures, I'd be happy to field those now. Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, John, are you ready to jump in? Thank yeah. you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, so um, I'm gonna discuss um, our agency safety plan, uh, which is an, another FTA requirement and um, very closely related to the transit asset management require, requirements, uh, especially when we think about system uh, safety and reliability. Um, and so the general requirement is that GMT has a safety plan uh, that includes a safety management system. And uh, I will go over some details of uh, what that actually means from an FTA perspective. Um, and there's really two primary goals of a agency safety plan. Uh, number one, to help uh, us manage our safety risks. And then number two, um, uh, help us prioritize our capital investments through a, a data-driven uh, process um, and make sure that we're making objective uh, decisions when it comes to uh, buses and facilities and uh, safety. Uh, next slide, Matt. So um, there's really four primary components. And so our safety plan is uh, built around these four components. And then there's some uh, subcomponents uh, for each one as well. Um, but the first one is the safety management policy. Um, and that's where we set our safety objectives. Uh, we are required to have a confidential employee reporting program. Um, and so that's primarily for uh, near miss events or uh, safety uh, events that may not rise to the level of a, a formal report or a police uh, investigation, um, but things we want to track for data so we can proactively uh, manage our safety risks. Um, that is uh, an uh, anonymous uh, program. Um, it's not meant to be punitive. It's really meant to uh, provide us the data um, in, in a confidential way so we can uh, analyze that data and then make proactive decisions. Um, we are uh, required to have organizational uh, accountabilities and responsibilities. So um, Clayton Clark, who's uh, on the board and on the meeting tonight, he's our accountable executive. Um, our board is required to um, approve this plan. Uh, and then we're also required to have a, a chief safety officer, and I uh, act in that capacity, uh, and it's really my job in that role to uh, implement the plan. Um, in terms of safety risk management, uh, that is uh, how we um, identify um, safety risks and how we develop uh, mitigation uh, planning uh, to uh, minimize any impacts from those. Um, the safety assurance piece, and that's what we'll talk about the next few slides, 
Um, that's the data uh, driven uh, process and that's the safety performance measurement. Uh, we'll talk about how those are developed, the coordination with the RPC, um, and then what the actual targets are um, based on our uh, existing conditions. Uh, and then lastly, and probably most importantly, uh, in terms of uh, making this a successful plan, uh, is the safety promotion. Um, and that includes both our uh, comprehensive safety training program, uh, which is uh, both for uh, new hires, uh, and depending if they're a bus driver or mechanic or other position in the company, that kind of dictates uh, that program, uh, but also reoccurring training. So we've recently done, you know, a hazardous material communication training for all of our uh, maintenance staff, for example, and really um, providing that refresher training to make sure that we're as safe as possible. Um, and then safety communication, always um, reminding our staff uh, of ways to be safe uh, and what our procedures and protocols are in terms of uh, safety management. Uh, next slide, Matt. So um, this is just an overview of what the requirements are from the FTA, and that's essentially uh, that we work with the uh, Regional Planning Commission as the MPO on um, developing these safety targets. Um, so we've uh, presented to the TAC and we've met with the uh, uh, staff on um, what our current targets are and how they were developed. Um, and then we formalized that uh, under a, uh, a written agreement with uh, CCRPC and VTRANS on what the process is uh, essentially to share that information around uh, performance targets. Uh, Matt, next slide. So um, GMT is required uh, to have four uh, different performance targets. Um, so this chart is a little confusing uh, because those targets have to re be reported by mode. Um, and so GMT uh, operates uh, three primary modes of public transportation service. Uh, MB is motor bus. That's the traditional fixed route city bus um, system. Uh, CB is commuter bus. So those are our uh, link services and our commuter services to Milton and Hinesburg and Jeffersonville. And then the uh, DR is demand response. Um, and there's two subcategories of that. Uh, we directly operate our own demand response uh, system in our rural service areas, which uh, are essentially Montpelier uh, in St. Albans. Uh, in Chittenden County, um, we subcontract out the ADA paratransit service uh, to SSTA, uh, as well as the uh, older adults and uh, disability uh, program. So that uh, last row is uh, the SSTA uh, data. Um, and then so each uh, one of those modes, we are required under the National Public Transit uh, Safety Plan uh, to report on fatalities, uh, injuries, uh, safety events, and system reliability. Uh, the first three categories, uh, we have to have targets uh, for uh, actual uh, number of occurrences, but also um, have targets for rate of occurrence. So um, we use um, a 100,000 uh, vehicle revenue miles, so essentially uh, the number of miles that buses are in service open to the public. Um, so that's how we base our, our, our rate uh, threshold. So, for example, um, fatalities, you know, our, our target is to have no fatalities uh, in our system. And so, again, um, zero per 100,000 miles. Uh, the injuries, um, our target is uh, 0.67 injuries per fiscal year. Um, and that injury uh, definition uh, is one that basically someone needs to be hospitalized for 48 hours uh, or have a broken bone, for example. Um, it's not, you know, somebody gets a bruise. Um, and that is less than a full uh, person because this uh, these targets were um, developed using a three-year rolling average of uh, actual um, reportable uh, incidents. Um, safety events, uh, 0.33. Uh, per year is our target. Um, that's kind of a wide uh, category, but that's things like uh, evacuations due to fire. Um, that uh, could be sabotage. It could be uh, cyber uh, security events. Um, and then the last category is system reliability. Um, and uh, the numbers shown are essentially the uh, average number of miles that we operate uh, in between breakdowns, which require us to remove that vehicle from service. So um, we want uh, the, the highest possible number there because that means we're doing fewer um, road calls and, and breakdowns. So uh, for that motor bus category, uh, it's essentially our goal that we can operate uh, for 18,000 miles um, before there's a breakdown that would impact service. Um, so those are the targets uh, that we uh, strive for. Um, again, these are based on rolling averages. So, uh, you know, we will update these, um, you know, each each year um, as we go. 
Um, Matt, next slide. John, John, quick question on that slide. Uh, the third line, DRDO, demand response, we don't qualify for that. What's the DO? Well, so uh, great question, Chris. Um, so GMT uh, is a unique transit organization because um, we do operate both in the urban uh, area of Chittenden County, but also Montpelier and, and St. Albans areas, as I mentioned. So um, this public uh, transit safety plan requirement is relatively new. Um, and because we operate both an urban system and a rural system, there was some uncertainty from GMT and truthfully the FTA, um, what we're required to report on the rural side, because uh, if we were just a standalone rural system, uh, none of these requirements apply uh, to rural systems. But because GMT operates uh, both urban and rural, um, this is essentially um, our, our rural demand response um, we're still trying to get some clarity if we need to report on that or not. So um, it's in our plan. We just don't have the the, the targets uh, populated. So the DO is what I'm just trying to unpack the acronym. Uh, maybe. Yep. The DO is directly operated. Yeah. Um, the PT is purchase transportation. That's the SSTA. That's a sure. urban program for the complementary yeah. paratransit. So that definitely needs to be um, reported. And then you mentioned on the motor bus, the safety events, possibly something with cyber. How does that impact a motor bus? Well, um, it, it doesn't necessarily, I guess it could, uh, depending on what the situation was. But um, so all of this data, we're required to report to the National Transit Database, which is another FTA requirement. Um, and so for each one of these categories, there's pretty strict um, uh, reporting thresholds and definitions. Um, so for the safety events, I think that's more intended for uh, physical uh, uh, injuries and, and uh, safety uh possibilities. You but, had just mentioned the two uh, examples were fire evacuation and cyber something. And I had thought how, how curious it was that cyber would impact a motor bus, but uh, maybe it's the management. I'll let you go on. I'm sorry to okay. delve yeah, into That's it. one of many in that category for the safety events. Uh, Matt, next slide. And then, so just to close out and I kind of tie it together. So um, clearly, uh, both the agency safety plan and the asset management plan, you know, focus on uh, both safety and reliability. Um, so we use both of these plans when we're uh, considering um, the uh, condition assessments and then uh, what we need to do for our safety management um, process, you know, based on those condition assessments. And then lastly, again, uh, really um, using the condition assessments uh, and our safety management uh, analysis uh, to help us identify where we need to invest in uh, either bus purchases or facility um, safety upgrades to make sure that we're operating uh, as safely as, as possible. And uh, that is the end of our presentation, and uh, we're certainly happy to answer any questions as, as needed. Folks, any thoughts on uh, vehicle replacement reliability? Go ahead, Garrett. Um, one thing I thought I noticed in one of the first charts is, is that it looked as though you were going to have to replace every motor bus by next year. Is that true? No. Is that so, 100%? Matt, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yes. So I believe, I believe the section, I apologize, I just stopped sharing the screen. I can probably get back to that slide. Yeah. Uh, we have a we have a commuter bus or a motor coach bus uh, section. Um, let me get back to that performance measures. Guys, I'm still stuck on the. So we have a. I believe what you might be referring to is the over the road coach that's 100% shown in 2025. So this is uh, MCI, our MCI buses that we purchased for the link, uh, for the Montpelier link. These are like the larger premier buses, the inner city coach buses that you'll see. Uh, 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 that entire fleet reaches the end of its useful life in 2025. Uh, but we're actually phasing this bus from our fleet. Unfortunately, we just do not have the demand on that uh, commuter service anymore that requires that type of bus. So we're going to be uh, switching back to the the 35 and 40 foot uh, transit bus uh, for the full service there. And, Great. and just thank to, you. That only represents um, seven of our buses out of our, you know, roughly 70 bus fleet. So it's a, it's a small percentage of our overall fleet number. 
And if you know of anyone that would like to buy seven uh, motor uh, coach buses, uh, let us know. <laughs> well, this is the price of remote work. I think it's uh, reduced the uh, need to, for those commuter buses. Um, I'll hope we can find a Partridge family of this new century that can retrofit it into a touring bus. <laughs> Probably sell it to some of the high schools around here. They're doing fairly well, you know, for their traveling teams. <laughs> Anyone else have questions uh, for the uh, crew from Green Mountain Transit? Uh, this has been uh, very comprehensive and wide ranging, but uh, it's nice to know that they're uh, keeping targets and measures. And, uh, we Thank you, John. Matt. <laughs> when do we start paying our fare again, uh, folks? <laughs> It'll probably be March 6th, the day after town meeting day. Bart, I want to get your question and thought in. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've been contemplating this and, you know, it doesn't really fit in tonight's agenda. But, you know, I appreciate the challenge that public transit is facing both in Green Mountain Transit and nationwide. You know, it might be worth at some point a review, and this may already be in the plans of, what's going on with ridership and cost revenues for GMT. Yep. There, there is work that's currently going on. There's a uh, study that is, uh, uh, the, was included in the T bill this year, the transportation bill, um, that's looking at how to find local match. And, uh, it's very much on, on people's minds. Good to see you, Bart. It is an invaluable service. I just uh, hope that we could continue the, uh, fair free operation because these are the type of things that become the backbone of uh, or should become more of our backbone for a transportation system rather than creating a whole new fleet of electric cars to supplement the gas cars that we've done for the last hundred odd years. So um, thank you folks. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on. Thanks, uh, we're going Have a good night. To, thank you. We're going to pick up with, uh, I believe it's items. I lost my thread here. Six, the uh, appropriately titled FTA Title VI program uh, update. And you have a draft that was attendant to your packet, uh, all 50-odd pages, I believe, and uh, 52 pages. Who would like to take us through that? We are going to need to approve this, uh, so we're going to be an MPO action on this. Yes, that's me. I'll just give a quick um, overview. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma, uh, the communications manager here at the RPC. Um, so as, as Chris mentioned, you all uh, received the draft 2023 FTA Title VI program with your packet, um, as well as a memo describing the program and the updates um, that were made since this was last prepared and approved way back in 2020. So it's a three-year program. Um, so just as a quick refresher, so everyone's on the same page, um, Title VI is a federal law that prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin um, in programs and activities that receive federal funds. So this particular Title VI program is required by and prepared for the Federal Transit Administration, or FTA. Um, so our FTA funds are largely passed through to Green Mountain Transit, uh, but we're still required to update this program every three years as a recip uh, recipient of those funds. So um, even though the FTA program, um, all 50 some on pages of it, as Chris mentioned, is pretty transit oriented, it's really specific to the projects that we work on. So since so many of them do have a transit connection, um, so this is really a CCRPC program and GMT and VTrans both have their own as well. Um, so just a couple quick notes about this update process. Um, this program was last updated in 2020, as I mentioned. Um, so through an existing contract that VTrans has for their own Title VI program, we were able to work with their consultant, um, who is the consultant GMT uses as well which was super helpful. Um, he worked with us to update all the information throughout, um, up large updates to the data, and he did multiple reviews as well of the full program to ensure that we're including all the necessary information that FTA requires. So that was really helpful. Um, so this, this three-year program reviews things like our Title VI policy statement, um, complaint procedure. So if someone does have a complaint, what do they do? How do they go about that? 
Um, it also looks back on our work over the last three years in terms of the projects that we do, the public engagement efforts that we make um, in our communities, and looks at projects uh, with specific outreach to marginalized communities, included um, and including limited English proficient individuals. Um, and it also has a lot of updated data and maps throughout it. So it's a lot of information. Um, and yeah, I'll sort of, I'll pause there. So the executive committee at their November 1st meeting um, sent this to the board for approval as presented. So following a, I guess, MPO vote, if it is approved at that point, it would be submitted to VTrans and FTA um, and uploaded on our website. So I will truly pause there. I'm happy to take any uh, comments or questions if anyone has them. Does anyone have any thoughts immediately for Emma? Um, this was seen at our executive uh, committee and staff had worked on it as she's pointed out uh, to update it from 2020 with the latest and the greatest. Um, and it's an MPO action. So we're going to be looking for votes from all the municipalities, VTrans, and I believe Absent Fuels Corps, correct? So um, anyone questions? If not, uh, I would accept a motion to uh, approve the FTA Title VI program as presented. And uh... so moved. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, is that a second, Andy? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion for folks? Any further questions for Emma? If not, please uh, raise your hand or say aye yeah. in favor. Aye. Aye. And anyone opposed or abstaining, please speak up. Thank you, MPO folks and uh, VTrans. And uh, thank you, Emma. This Thanks, is, everyone. Uh, great. We're going to move on now to item seven, which would be uh, ECOS plan. And where am I? I am completely back up to the top here. ECOS plan update on ECOS place review. Hey, folks, how are you doing tonight? Um, can you see my shared screen? Yes. Excellent. All right. And can you see, let's swap that. Can you see the presentation view? Yes. Thank you, Lenny. So uh, last two months, we've talked about Ecos Prosperity, and we've talked about uh, Ecos People. Tonight, we're going to talk about Ecos Place. A lot of big, meaty topics, but I will do my best to uh, move quickly. Uh, these are the Three themes of the ECOS plan, prosperity, people, and place. Under place, you'll see we'll be talking about land use, transportation, housing, climate change, um, and ecological systems, water quality. Uh, as a reminder, the second draft of the ECOS plan that you have in your packet, uh, edits have been made to this document um, related to just data updates, particularly around the enhanced energy plan. So your energy section, the climate change section is going to have a bunch of data updated around that. Um, we also wanted to better address issues related to equity inclusion throughout the entire document. And then we also wanted to address uh, comments from the Long Range Planning Committee and the Planning Advisory Committee. They had commented on a first draft of the plan way back in 2022. And so this draft that we've developed here in 2023 uh, tries to address those comments. Uh, and the intent of talking to you folks about uh, these three distinct elements of the, of the ECOS plan this fall is just to uh, give you a general sense about what's been added, what's been deleted, and to provide a forum for folks to ask questions or provide comments. Uh, any questions there? So I've removed a bunch of the information about how we've organized the ECOS plan, because I'm hoping you've remembered it after two months. Um, but to quickly summarize, uh, we're really going to review changes here in, in two different categories. First category is goals and key issues. And the second category is strategies and actions. And so we have a land use section that is what we have a land use goal. And we talk about specific key issues in the world of land use under that goal. And so there we've reorganized that, uh, that key issue sections to have multiple subtopics um, just to provide a better, better readability to that section. Uh, we've provided additional uh, context in terms of the history of land use planning in Chittenden County and, and nationally and um, how that kind of led to suburbanization and uh, led to our, our uh, current issues with, with sprawl and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, and then we specifically talk about um, commuting patterns. And you know, one of the things that really struck me in, in making this last revision was that um, I think back in 2002, about 75% of Chittenden County workers lived in Chittenden County. And that's now down under 65%. And so pretty clear trend in terms of people commuting into the county from outside to work. Um, and there's obviously some pretty big land use implications there and climate uh, implications. Uh, there is a uh, a new housing uh, goal. Um, and there we talk about a bunch of new data related to homelessness, related to rental vacancy rate, which is very, very low. Um, we talk about short-term rentals and the impact of the housing market. And then we specifically talk about our Building Homes, camp or building homes Together campaign, uh, Building Homes Together 2.0. Uh, and the goal that we've set there is to create a thousand new housing units uh, per year in Chittenden County, 250 of which are especially affordable. We also talk about the Home Act um, and the still under development Vermont Zoning Atlas that we hope will be complete by the time we uh, adopt the plan in 2025. In the transportation section, uh, we've really updated it to reflect the MTP that was passed by the board this past year. Um, we revised data related to transit ridership, uh, vehicle miles traveled, and uh, emissions. Any questions there before I move on? Okay. Uh, climate climate goal, we've just really reorganized and uh, expanded to get more specific about this, the impacts that we'll see here uh, in Chittenden County and specifically the impacts on vulnerable populations. Uh, in the energy and greenhouse gas emissions goal and key issue section, uh, we use updated LEAP data, so that updated energy target data that were provided, uh, is provided to us by the Department of Public Service. Um, and so we've updated targets related to uh, how many EVs we want to have here uh, by 2050 to meet our, our state energy goals, how many uh, new heat pumps, um, how do we want to re reduce VMT, that sort of thing. And also a uh, uh, revised target for uh, electricity generation within the region. Ecological systems, goals and key issues. Again, a bunch of reorganization, reorganization under subtopics, and more detail on the impacts of climate change. Um, and more in, or, uh, more discussion about what the TMDL is and what it means for us and our specific work here at Chittenden County in terms of the, uh, uh, the road erosion inventories that we do, um, a missile roads general permit, and uh, some of the work about the quack and the quick on non-regulatory uh, water quality topics. Uh, we also talked specifically about uh, the passage of Act 59 last year and the state's conservation goals, the 30 by 30 and the 50 by 50 goals, um, and just provide some context about how our work and our land use work is going to fit into that goal. Uh, lastly, in the infrastructure and facilities, a goal and key issues, we just update information on all the public facilities that exist in Chittenden County. And then we talked specifically about uh, our broadband efforts to the creation of the Chittenden County Communications Union District this past year. Any questions here? Okay, strategies and actions. What are we gonna do? So, land use strategy has uh, been changed to align with the MTP. The MTP for a while, 2019, or 2018, 2019, um, has had a goal of 90% of new development, uh, new housing units, uh, in areas planned for growth. Ecos plan has been 80%, and so we're just getting into alignment with the MTP now. We've also just really reworded the actions to be much more direct. Um, and we've added uh, some actions related to broadband in our in our uh, work in terms of the CCUD, CCCUD. Um, housing now has a specific strategy. It used to be underneath land use, um, so we, we have its own standalone strategy, and that strategy is really based on that Building Comes Together 2.0 campaign. Joe, go ahead. Hey, Taylor, thanks. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, my I, my question about land use was um, a couple of meetings ago, Charlie talked about the potentially some common um, land use uh, categories that the RPCs are working through. And I know it's, I think it's a study that's underway um, but is that something that you guys are thinking about as part of this plan? And, you know, or, we, or is, it, is, is the timing just off to kind of use whatever might come out of that initiative? 
Good question. Charlie is going to give you the details of that study here under his uh, his executive director report in a second. But Joe, I think you know we we've adjusted our timeline to um, make sure that we're uh, we have time to uh, respond to any legislation that's happened this year. And so you know the, the future land use map you see in this plan here probably will be different when we start the adoption process next fall yeah. if legislation passes. So we yeah we. We've it's pushed in our timeline to be to yeah to be flexible and to react. Okay, thank you. Transportation strategy uh, again based on the MTP. A lot of actions were taken just from the MTP just to integrate the two plans together. So nothing too too exciting there. Um, it is a new strategy though because transportation used to be under land use just like housing. Uh, same with climate and energy. Uh, so we have a separate strategy just for that. Um, we've updated our strategy related to greenhouse gas emission and energy reduction targets. Um, I do want to call out that uh, our we had a, uh, an energy subcommittee to our long range planning uh, committee this past summer. And one of the things that they uh, one of the actions they've recommended is to recommend to the PUC that they reassess the sound rule related to wind generation. Um, they felt really strongly about that. Um, uh, they're, they're, um, uh, justification really being that our, our rules are very restrictive, even, uh, in, uh, comparison to other New England states. Um, and so they're not asking for anything specific. They're just asking for the PUC to reassess what the rule says, uh, specifically about uh, sound and uh, about a lot of the data that needs to be collected related to the sound rules. Um, moving on to water quality. Um, we do make a, a recommendation about having river corridors be uh, state administered instead of uh, locally administered. Um, so that is a, a another maybe mildly controversial recommendation. Um, and we did add a, an action too. This is a little bit of a misnomer, this language here, but to uh, just to bring light to the fact that there um, is some now some confusion in the, the stormwater world where some of our S MS4 communities um, that have uh, an MS4 permit related to their stormwater systems uh, have to do um, uh, essentially some monitoring of how stormwater is managed on sites, but they don't do the actual permitting, the state does, and there's some confusion over that topic. Um, and so our MS4 committee has, has raised that issue and wanted to address it in the plan. Uh, lastly, um, in the ecological systems working land section, um, just wanted to reference the statewide farm to plate plan and the statewide climate action plan because there's a whole bunch of very specific um, actions in those plans that are very relevant to Chittenden County that we just want to adopt by reference. Chris, go ahead. Yes, uh, in relation to the water quality state administered river corridor regulation, in light of uh, you know our flooding four months ago, um, are, what was the thrust and who was uh, asking for that? Uh, is it the result of uh, not enough local control or uh, too much? Um, so staff staff is really the one that has proposed such to the LRPC. Um, and so, you know, I think staff's perspective and, you know, having our ear to the ground a, a little bit um, in terms of what's happening in Montpelier, you know, the, the, the thought is that municipalities haven't really locally adopted river corridor regulations as ANR um, has been asking municipalities to do since about 2012. Um, and so, you know, these areas that are subject to fluvial erosion are really not being protected locally. Gotcha. Um, All right. So the idea is to get ahead of any hodgepodge of local control or lack of local control along those things. Gotcha. And, or really just to recognize the fact, too, that, that there hasn't been as much municipal adoption as anticipated. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, and that if we truly want to protect these areas from the impacts of erosion, there there probably needs to be state regulation of this, not local regulation of this, that, that specific Thank area. Thank you. Any other questions for me? So I know it's a lot, and so I'll just say that, you know, if, if you have a half hour over your Thanksgiving holiday that you want to read the ECOS plan, you have it. You have a draft, and if you want to talk to me, um, about any comments, questions you have on that draft, I'm more than willing to, to have a phone conversation, Teams meeting. Um, 
connect in any any which way, you know, through um, at least the end of November. Then the, the draft goes off the copy editor and we won't have it for a couple months. Um, we can still talk certainly in, in January and February, but um happy to have those conversations the rest of the month. Thanks, Chris. Great. And thank you, uh, Taylor. So the um, the three categories, again, are place and back us up to the other two. Prosperity, people, place. Prosperity, people, place. The three Ps. So uh, the three Ps. Right. And I'm, you may see a slightly reorganized eco split <laughs> the next well, time you see it next summer. Sure. But, but we're going to have to yeah. fit the subtopics under each of the place, prosperity, and people. And again, our target deadline is October or February, October 2024 or February 2025. Good, good question. It's a moving target. I think now we've, we've somewhere in between. <laughs> we've officially set June 2025 as the date of adoption. Thank you. Uh, anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. And uh, we're going to move on to item uh, eight equity update and Nelson. All right. It's nice to see you all. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to share my screen, even though I'm just doing a normal brief equity update. I figured it might be helpful for you to visualize this instead of me just listing them out. Um, okay. Nothing major for you all since last time we met. This is just kind of an overview of, you know, my time is split between all of these things. Um, Internally, still working on developing a code of conduct that will come your way in the final will come your way in January, but I'm going to send out a draft to all of you all staff equity advisory committee members to review in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm we're hoping to partner with Burlington's restorative justice center. I met with the, that director today to kind of flesh out some more language and process content. Um, other internal work, the equity action plan is still in process. I'm working with an intern on that and staff are going to review that content the week after Thanksgiving. Recently, I've been doing some kind of professional development stuff. I went to the Government Alliance on Race and Equity conference, which was virtual. And the Northern New England American Planning Association conference was last week in New Hampshire. Um, externally. Uh, still equity advisory committee meetings are still happening every month. Relationship building, meeting with different folks, getting to know people, ECOS plan. Uh, I've been working with Taylor and Sarah and Darren and all the other ECO staff on starting to develop a community engagement plan. Um, so the next equity advisory committee meeting this month will dig into kind of figuring out how they want to be involved in the community engagement for updating that plan. And then starting, I'm, I'm kind of in conversation with uh, CVOEO, Burlington's REIB office, and a Winooski-based group that works with new Americans called Winooski Parents and Students, just kind of um, starting to figure out ways we could potentially partner with CVOEO. It would be around housing, Burlington's REIB office around kind of community engagement and public participation plan. And then Winooski parents and students would be community engagement, hopefully with this ECOS plan. So anyways, lots of things that on any given day, I'm doing something related to one of these things. But any questions about Can you unpack anything in this REIB list? REIB on Burlington's REIB office? Oh, Again, yes. I, I might have missed it. Sorry. No, I shouldn't have put that acronym there. It's the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Office for Berlin, for the city of Burlington. Well, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I might point out I was uh, pleased and honored to be able to go to an equity advisory committee meeting uh, at the end of October. So I was happy because they were working on the uh, code of conduct at that time. And uh, I saw the paper from the previous meeting where uh, uh, if you look in your minutes for this uh, month's packet, uh, you'll see the uh, a recap of the whole meeting, but it was nice. Uh, I, I think uh, they were coming up with the ideas and then trying to, um, you know, um, narrow it down. But it's 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 an undertaking, uh, and that's the second chapter in the three things that uh, um, they've been working on. Go ahead, Bard. 
Chris, I don't know if this makes sense um, to put this on Ann's radar as well. As mentioned in a couple of venues, the what I think is a plausible uh, need to um, perhaps do a little better with onboarding of new commission members. And I, I put it, frankly, kind of in the context of recruiting and onboarding people from traditionally underrepresented communities. Um, where perhaps we made it easier to join the commission as a member, you know, in terms of an onboarding plan um, and clearer, it might help with that in terms of recruiting uh, new members of the commission. I don't know if that makes sense. And if you have any comments on that. Yeah, it's definitely come up in multiple settings, both this question of how do we recruit, who gets to be a part of different committees um, how do we decide? How do we prioritize if we get to a point where we need to prioritize membership? Can we outline a process for that? Because we don't we don't really have one right now, at least certainly not for the Equity Advisory Committee. So that's come up. And then your onboarding question. Yes, I think as a part of this code of conduct, which is only one piece of onboarding, we'll have to kind of decide what implementation of this looks like. So is there, you know, do we want to kind of revisit this annually when somebody joins a committee or the board? What does the process look like to kind of learn and review and reflect on what's going to be in that code of conduct, whether it's training, signing it, um, you know, casually reviewing it, whatever that might look like. So if anybody has idea, I mean, a draft will come your way and you'll get to submit comments and feedback that way with, you know, content on a page. But if you have thoughts around that or know of examples from elsewhere that work well, definitely let me know. Well, I was thinking not specifically about diversity and code of conduct itself, but mm -hmm. if we were trying to recruit somebody who is not adequately familiar, perhaps didn't know what is this regional planning commission and how would I become comfortable and competent in onboarding mm -hmm. as a member of the commission itself, not about the diversity, equity, inclusion policy, but like, what's this UPWP thing? Mm -hmm. How would I know what that is? That's, I'm thinking content um, specific to sort of the roles and activities of the commission itself. I it's see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at some point, maybe putting together like some kind of training, or we talked about like a residence guide at some point, like this kind of graphic booklet that explains in really simple terms, what we are, what we do, you know, explains all the jargon and the acronyms and to make it more accessible, because it's not right now. Um, ben. Yeah, um, during the October 25th meeting, uh, there was some discussion about how um, arriving at some sort of a vote to have uh, an individual from the a member or an attendee, one of the groups that uh, individuals, uh, members of the advisory committee to be um, chosen to get some training in conflict resolution with respect to, you know, uh, handling or to uh, address um, complaints or issues of um, discrimination or harassment and the like. Could you... Uh, elucidate and uh, let us know it tell us a bit more about that is that uh, was that a firm proposal? yeah where is that going it's not a firm proposal so this came up in the meeting around this question of like who manages conflict whether it's in within the equity advisory committee or between staff members or board members and so an equity advisory committee member throughout the idea of maybe there is kind of a designated individual on the committee or maybe two or three individuals on the committee who are kind of responsible for managing conflict and they could go through some kind of training um, prior to doing so and then take the lead on that. I don't have a firm answer yet, Ben. I That's part of the reason that I met with Rachel Jolly from Burlington's Restorative Justice Center to kind of pick her brain a little bit about that. And I think what's going to end up happening is we will partner with the restorative justice center and use them as an external contact to do that mediation and management work so it's not happening from yeah. and how if, if we get to that, that point yeah how does that fit in with the authority that for example the executive director or the chair of the commission has 
um, to actually be the, the point uh, and authorized in as much as, for example, there's federal funding and the like, and therefore um, responsibilities and authorities are set out um, for mm -hmm. this organization to process such complaints and um, situations. Yeah, I think for the federally mandated language, like when it reaches that point of, you know, legal harassment or legal discrimination, that process is going to look different than the, you know, the 95% of maybe 99% of the time that it doesn't reach that point. And maybe there is, you know, there is somebody that you report to that is designated to receive complaints. But as far as managing and organizing and a conflict resolution process when the outcome is not formal suspension or resignation or even uh, formal reprimand, that that process can happen a little bit more. Um, well, thank you. Through dialogue. Yeah. Hopefully I'll have clearer answers for you, Ben, by the time we send this draft out. <laughs> um, so. so yeah, I'll look forward to hearing your, all thought, your thoughts. Yeah, I think it was sort of like our uh, Supreme Court uh, new code of ethics. You know, we've got these great ideas in the code of conduct, but we don't yet have a way to enforce it. So uh, this is a work in progress. You're correct, Benjamin. Uh, anything else, Ann Nelson? That's it for me. Okay. Um, so uh, hot off the presses would be... Uh, uh, item number nine, draft municipal delegation S-100 report, and literally hot off the presses. So uh, I'm sure we'll all be interested to hear more about this. Is this Charlie? Yeah, I got this. Um, and uh, oh, I was just going to say goodbye to Elaine, but whoosh, she's uh, gone. <laughs> whoosh. <laughs> uh, now, um, so apologies for the um, lateness of this getting to you. Um, and it just came out to you, I think, this morning, Amy. Um, but um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to walk you through it. Um, I think maybe uh, Chris would make sense. I'll, I'll just, I'll pull, I'll share my screen and. Yeah, if you um, want to high spot it, I don't think we, you know, I, I think it's got the four uh, main pieces. But I think, yeah, you, you know what they're saying in well, the. Summary right, I'll, is I'll, very good. Yeah, I'll just give you an overview, and then if anybody wants to dive deeper, um, let me know. Um, this is one of the reports and summer studies that S100 required, um, and it was uh, required of VAPTA um, to produce this report about the dele uh, possibilities or a framework for delegating Act 250 permits to, or the administration of Act 250 permits to municipalities. Um, and if you read through the document, you'll see, yes, the legislature asked for that specific thing. Um, and this was really uh, uh, something that particularly the city of Burlington asked the legislature to consider as part of S-100. It was actually in S-100 for a little bit, like actual legislation to allow that delegation um, it came out during the process and the study resulted. At some point, it was going to be just a CCRPC uh, required study, but it became all of the RPCs through VAPTA, our statewide association. Um, nonetheless, uh, I, um, I have had responsibility for working on this uh, and facilitating this process. Um, and you'll note if you read through it that this has primarily been an, an interest for our more urban municipalities, um, Burlington, Winooski, maybe South Burlington, St. Albans City um, have been the four municipalities that have been working with me on this. And the, um, the idea is not exactly what the legislature asked, which is a municipality administering Act 250 permits. It's more... Um, showing the NRB that the municipality has regulations in place and processes in place that are functionally equivalent to Act 250, um, and therefore they could enter into a delegation agreement with the NRB, where the N NRB would review what they have. The RPC would be involved in recommending to the NRB that 
their regulations are of, of you know high enough standards that Act 250 probably isn't adding a lot of additional value in that municipality or that portion of a municipality. And so they could enter into this delegation agreement. Um, so that's kind of the major gist of this. Um, and this is um, you know, a little companion study to the other three studies that are going on around Act 250, uh, the designation program and the future land use uh, mapping that uh, Joe asked about earlier, but that I re reviewed with you last month. Um, and, and frankly, this is maybe somewhat of an alternative if, if there aren't, if the municipality can't get exemptions through those other, or the legislation doesn't move forward um, and provide exemptions for those tier one, you know, planned growth areas that are being talked about in those other studies. This could be an alternate route for our, you know, kind of most sophisticated municipalities to um, have a route to have delegation from Act 250 and kind of get out from under Act 250 regulation uh, in their municipality. So that's the gist of this. Um, there's a lot, you know, it's not a real long report, frankly. It's only, I think, like really substantively six or seven pages. Um, most of it's about process. You know, um, we weren't trying to figure out exactly what every regulation, you know, uh, lines up with every of the yeah, I think there's 32 criteria and sub criteria in Act 250. Uh, we weren't trying to go line by line because every town has different, you know, regulations in place. And so, but what we were trying to do was kind of outline a process for this happening uh, that would involve the RPC um, and, you know, try to be kind of the highest level of uh, <coughs> municipal planning and regulation. And sorry, Dana, did you want to jump in? Um. I was just thinking about the UPWP and um, if housing is going to be a priority in terms of providing technical assistance to municipalities in our next round. Yeah, no, I think that, that continues to be a priority. Yep. Um, okay. And, I, you know, I think, of course, the priorities are also defined by the towns. So we'll. <laughs> We'll right. see, you know, how many of them. We've already had some requests for towns that are working on uh, housing issues, um, you know, or uh, housing needs assessments that we've helped towns with, or reviewing housing bylaws, you know, and it, which I think we did for Essex maybe before you left there, right? Uh, it was great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that work is continuing. Yeah, and that that could be some of the supportive work that we can help with uh, getting municipality. You know, up to this, uh, up to this kind of bar, but but this is a very, it's a very intense process, frankly, for a municipality. I'm, um, it's, um, I'm not sure the feedback I'm getting from other uh, parts of the state uh, uh, that you know there aren't a lot of municipalities interested in this level of work to try to get delegation, but we certainly have some here in Chittenden County, which is um, hence why I'm in this position. Uh, with regard to this study, um, any uh, and and I should mention one other thing, which is um, as part of the charge in this uh, to do this report, the legislature required us to have a public meeting in every region, and here you are. Uh, this is a public meeting <laughs> in uh, Chittenden County on this topic. So um, appreciate any feedback and um, taking feedback uh, at least for the next few weeks. I think probably December eleventh is probably. Um, as far out as uh, I could take any comments on this, uh, we have to get this finalized by December 31st. Charlie, do you see this working similar to some of our uh, conformance uh, letters on municipal plans so that, uh, you know, we would tell the NRB that, you know, Colchester's uh, planning and zoning conforms with um, the Act 250 criteria that they set out or so? And, and that we would then be reviewing and signing off on that? Is that where our charge would work? And we'd have to do that maybe yearly or something? Um, I th Well, I think there would be um, probably a more intense review than we do for some of those permitting, you know, Act 250 or Section 248 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think we'd have to do a deeper dive into municipal regulations and kind of go, you know, criterion by criterion. 
what, all 400 pages of their land development regulations. And, yeah. Right. And, the, and if the municipality is applying for it, they have a self-interest in, you know, showing us <laughs> where in their regs they feel like they're you know meeting or exceeding uh, the uh, addru- how well they address the issues compared to Act 250. Um, so I think this can be kind of um, it is definitely would be a deeper dive uh, with the municipality and uh, probably much more detailed than our normal, you know, two page conformance letters that we've been doing. Um, oh, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, it, I'll it, let Joe get his question in here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Huntington yeah, wants had, in. Yeah, Charlie, um, I did have a chance to kind of look through it. And I, I really like this as a, just the policy of it. Um, and, you know, just from my own experience, you know, on traffic issues at the local level and then going to testify again in Act 250, it always felt like being tried twice for the same crime and without really adding, you know, a lot of extra value maybe. And, um, you know, maybe it is a pretty tough process um, for a municipality to go through, but it seems like it would be worth it, worth the effort. Um, And, but uh, I had just a couple of quick you know, these are, this is maybe down in the weeds a little bit, but it noted that um, uh, RPCs might might be designated as an interested party um, mm. at in the local review process, and um, and I was thinking, well, what does what does that really mean, and is it really necessary? Because I, I, it's not like at the local level you need to be um, you need to have party status like an Act 250, right? I think anybody can kind of show up at the local level and provide testimony and challenge things. Um, so did that mean something beyond that? Um, and it, I and think if it does, really... if it is some sort of special designation, you know, maybe the adjacent communities should have a similar, you know, um, mm-hmm. role if it's, if it's a regional, a really large project where the impacts might spill out over municipal boundaries. Yeah. Um, so that's one. And the other one is sort of quick, which is, um, it looks like the the natural resources board would be sort of the final um, decision maker on whether or not a municipality is approved for this. And um, is there any thought about an appeal process to that? You know, if a municipality gets rejected by by the natural resources board, but feels like, hey, you know, we really did a good job addressing all the you know the ten criteria, or someone else might even challenge us. That they might say, gosh, we we don't think the municipality should have been you know given that delegation and. I'm not sure there should be an appeal process, but it's just something to think about a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. just a couple of comments there. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and I, th- I think that, yeah, the appeal option we did kind of talk about, and um, obviously the legislature will do what they're going to do. Um, I, at this point, with the municipalities we were working with, I think they kind of we kind of came to the conclusion like the NRB should kind of own this process for better or worse and be the final decision maker. But that that appeal question probably is going to come up, and um, yeah, I, I think that's a possibility that there might be an appeal process. Um, and then the interested party thing, I don't think it's yeah so much about like the yeah, the traditional Act 250 party status, all that kind of stuff. It's really more about um, if if uh, and and this is really much more about the rest of the state because. We do st- uh, substantial regional impact a little differently than the rest of the state, right? Um, most of the state RPCs have um, all kinds of thresholds depending on different kinds of uses. You know, I don't know, 100 housing units or right. you know, 50,000 square foot of retail or something, right, that trigger a statement of regional impact or substantial regional impact. Um, and it was more about just getting notice. Uh, that there was a project of that scale going through the municipality, because otherwise we don't really see anything ab- about municipal permits or municipal permit applications and wouldn't have an easy way to know that it was going on. Yeah. And maybe so, so maybe that should apply to adjacent municipalities. Yeah, that's um, I think that's a friendly amendment. And, you know, and there's a similar issue, I think, I think that we tried to point out in here about, um, you know, state agencies. Like, right. you know, typically yeah. state agencies were able to comment through Act 250. If Act 250 is not there, you know, but there's an impact on a state highway or a natural resource that DEC cares about, how do they hear about it? Um, right. So I think there is something to think about there. I'm not sure we have it fully figured out, but um, 
there yeah so thank you for that and and the neighboring town is good <laughs> thank you yeah thank you uh, mayor lot thanks um just to make sure i'm following hmm. the nrb makes the final decision but the rpc is facilitating the like the sort of application process um we the, so the municipality would say you know we want to apply for this uh, delegation um and and probably do most of the work um to show what they have in their regs and the rpc would review it with the municipality oh, okay. and kind of be in partnership going to the nrb of saying the municipality requests and the rpc supports and has reviewed their regs and do believe that they're meeting you know similar types of standards as the uh, act 250 criteria so it's more of okay a that makes sense thank yeah. you uh, yeah, and that really came about, I think, mostly from the legislature, you know, I think seemed to want us, when they were talking about it this past, you know, early in 23, uh, seemed to feel more comfortable with having, you know, some other third party in the mix uh, beyond the town and the NRB, um, and we were kind of the natural kind of party to include in that. And and, and uh, Christine, thank you to Eric for all his contributions. He's put a lot of effort into this. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Yeah, no, really appreciate it. Any any other feedback for me? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, well, you can keep rolling on the other S100 reports and then remind us uh, of okay. uh, what we're doing in two weeks on uh, the legislative breakfast on a Tuesday, uh, December 5th. Yeah. Um, other S100 reports, um, the future land use uh draft um thank you for uh, your comments last month is out for public review right now um and actually taylor i don't know while i'm talking are you able to put that the link to the vapta page where um that is out there um for folks um and uh, we're trying to get comments on that future land use draft report by december 1st uh so that's got an earlier timeline we are awaiting patiently almost um, the draft reports from Act 250 group and um, the designation study. Um, but there's, if you were to read them side by side, um, there's slightly different term. Well, no, there's different terminology being used in the three studies, but we're all kind of talking about the same ideas, which is in our most built environment areas. Um, the Act 250 call, study is calling it tier one. The designation study is calling it, you know, neighborhood areas or, or build ready areas. And we're calling it planned growth areas. But the whole idea is let's try to get to a place where uh, the municipality has uh, decent bylaws and water and sewer that they could get exempt from Act 250. Um, and in the Act 250 study, you'll see there's more language around what they've been calling Tier 3, which is the other end of the spectrum, the natural resource areas, um, and trying to do more to protect those um, in exchange for this exemption in our more urban areas to promote housing growth. Um, so I'm waiting for those other studies to come out. Um, we'll share those, uh, try to get those um, out and links to those studies out to the board and uh, alternates as soon as we see them um, and to pr probably to our uh, planning advisory committee as well to the town planners uh, for folks to look at um, but I'm still fairly encouraged that this seems to be coming together and folks seem to be rowing in the same direction um, I don't know any quick feedback sorry I feel like I've been telling you the same thing every month for six months now so all right, no questions, no quick answer, re reactions there. Um, well, let me ask uh, the link that was just um, posted, and I tried to do the other ones. Uh, there was, was there a future land use map? I was visually quickly scrolling through it looking for a map. <laughs> there is no map. Okay. We were just trying to get to common uh, terminology and mm -hmm. kind of definitions and criteria. Um, 
We, I'm, uh, I'm used to our town's uh, future land use map, which has the fuzzy colors and uh, paint yeah. by numbers, but uh, they aren't paint by numbers. You know, they're not to be taken literally, so, <laughs> but it gets yeah, everybody um, excited. Yeah, our future land use map is over my right shoulder here. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think this is our map is largely based on your municipal zoning um, and also where there's infrastructure. So I'm at least not, I don't know, Taylor can argue with me if he wants, but I don't think we're anticipating huge changes in our map other than terminology um, to line up with the, the consistent terminology. And uh, he, Taylor? Well, we'll see. We, we, uh, uh, we did a super secret, you know, first, first cut today, Pam did, um, kind of translating our existing future land use map to into these new categories and you know there's going to be some some geographic areas we're going to have to take a closer look at but i, I think generally you're right charlie that that for most yeah. of the county it should be a pretty smooth transition and we'll probably have to talk to some municipalities a little bit more in detail yeah i think the challenging places and i know you can't see the map really behind me but um the village areas that uh, towns have defined um that don't have water and sewer you know, I think are maybe a little bit of a discussion point for sure that we need to have with some towns. Um, am I guessing right at the areas that are mostly? I don't want to name names, but yeah, yeah, the, the village areas with maybe yeah. with just water or just sewer or neither but planned. And how do we quite do it? You know, map future land use areas there. Um, yeah, that's that's one of my areas of concern. Yeah. So, and Chris, to your point, um, you know, there will be, uh, people are going to want to see the map <laughs> soon. Uh, I think the RPCs are kind of wrestling with like, um, you know, we don't want to waste a lot of time mapping before we kind of get to final definitions and criteria. So we're kind of playing around and doing some iterations right now. Um, but the other big part about this is is trying to be as inclusive as possible around the whole state. Uh, with towns being able to participate, you know, in Act 250 exemptions or just participate in uh, having housing growth, right? So, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious to see how it plays out myself, Chris. <laughs> so. The sparks will fly when the maps uh, <laughs> get displayed, as always yeah. happens. So, and 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 to be transparent with you all, right? The legislature. Um, had their eyes wide open and you know they i think as they did with the energy planning would prefer that we work with our municipalities and our uh, citizenry locally to try to get to good maps rather than um, trying to do uh, a state map that gets pushed down from the state onto all of us right so i think they're uh, strategically being purposeful <laughs> like let's try to do a little bit more bottoms up mapping rather than uh, top down. So something to look forward to. And that's, you know, one of the reasons for sure that we wanted to extend the timeline on doing our ECOS plan. And Joe, this goes back to your question earlier, you know, so that um, if the legislature does do this, that you, then we could have a few months to work with our towns and update the future land use maps to reflect the new legislation. So. All right. Good. Um, Leg moving. legislative breakfast. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to ask happening. Bard. I'm going to ask Bard to be there in my place because I'm going to be out of town. I'm afraid. Oh, thank you. That's right. Bard, congratulations. Thank you. I've won breakfast. <laughs> well, you you have to speak for your breakfast. Yes. Um, so um, I'm working on a draft. Um, I was I've got I've tried to boil it down. Last year we had like twelve topics or something that we tried to review with them, and it was just too much. Um, so let me run this by you and see how it sounds. I, I do have this kind of housing planning and permitting reform as one major issue. You know, we know these studies are coming. We know that there's draft legislation being drafted. Um, so that's one. Number two is climate resilience. Um, 
Taylor kind of touched on this in his report about the ECOS plan. Um, there's definitely going to be a bill about how do we do a better job as a state, you, you know, not just being prepared, but uh, protecting you know people and property from flood damage in the future. Uh, that is going to be around, at least part of it is going to be around river corridor and floodplain regulation um, and getting more consistent statewide. Um, switching gears, a third one, we've had the last couple of years been transit financing. The legislature asked GMT and Clayton, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but uh, or asked uh, the Vermont Public Transit Association, v VPTA, did I have that right? Um, to come back with recommendations on the transit financing? Mm -hmm. That is correct. And so part of the T-bill this year was for a study to be looking at non-federal match um, uh, for local transit agencies. And, uh, and so they're going to have a report for the legislature. One of the things that they're finding, uh, which I think probably is not too surprising, is that the, uh, the biggest gaps um, is in the, in the GMT urban area. And so, uh, so I think that that's going to highlight really the need uh, for a different uh, mechanism here in Chinook County. Congratulations to us all. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, that should be interesting. Yeah, and yeah, that's a tough political conversation in the in the state house, right? Because it's so Chinook County centric and oh so popular. Um, there, there, there is no doubt that uh, looking at. Um, some of the discussions that we had last year, for example, the reason why folks did not want to add funds for extending uh, zero fare uh, was the, the concern about having folks outside of Chittenden County subsidizing, you know, zero fare for, for Chittenden County. Yeah. Um, the, the next one is also a, a municipal financing one. I think, um, Michael, you brought this up. Uh, local options tax. So this has been something VLCT has been asking for is to um, make it easier for municipalities to um, be able to uh, apply a, uh, the local options tax. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. If it's with some, um, I, I think maybe it's really asking the state to just allow municipalities to do that without having to go through individual state approval town by town every time. Um, and then um, the fifth uh, major, well, I don't know how major it is, but policy area legislation is open meaning law. And this is maybe a little bit more of a small thing, but um, you know, this meeting, for instance, you know, is you're all virtual. Um, and I, our ability to do this kind of meeting is gonna expire early in 24. Um, so there's kind of a uh, discussion to can we ex keep extending this at least for um, organizations or committees that you know maybe aren't the select boards or the school boards, but um, uh, you know and, and at least our committees and things like that where it's much easier to get people together virtually. Um, and then um, so that was it. I just had those five kind of legislative topics. I don't know if anybody has any other one that's kind of thinks should we should emphasize. Um, let us let us know or any of the um, oh, Harry, yeah, Andy. Is there I don't this may be too late, it may be too big, but with all the public safety, the um you know, like downtown Burlington is in pretty rough shape. And I know there are other areas as well. Um is there anything in the legislative breakfast that we might be able to touch on that with? What yeah, I don't I have not heard too much about what might be getting pursued, Andy, but um, if- Well, there might if, be a way to get that conversation going. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and I'm sorry, Jeff, uh, Christine, did you want to jump on that? Yeah, I was just going to share that VLCT is, is doing some effort around that to make some recommendations for public safety. I- I find it harder to make a connection to the RPC's work in that area. Yeah. And Jeff? We cannot forget, especially since a good chunk of our delegation is new, that we have to continue to beat the drum 
that we can't have things that come after us to try to level the playing field between Northwest Vermont and the rest of the state by trying to put impediments in the way of our producing the resources that are needed to carry the rest of the state. We just, we have so many new members mm -hmm. and Chittenden County Envy is all throughout parts of uh, the legislature. And, and that, you know, obviously when we were talking about how they don't want to subsidize zero fares in Chittenden County, we have to make sure that, you know, public transit fares in Chittenden County, we have to make sure that if you do stuff, which inhibits our ability to do what we need to do to keep the economy regenerating itself and yes, growing that it's to the detriment of the rest of the state. Uh, we, we just can't, yeah. these are our advocates. We have to arm them with the things that they need to do to address that issue when it comes up in their committees. And we are not doing ourselves a service if we do not equip them to do that. Maybe we don't have to do it at the breakfast. We have to mention it. And then we have to give them something that arms them um, from the resource perspective. Otherwise, we'll just be carving up a smaller overall pie between the same number of people. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So, yeah, we have been trying to make that point year after year, but we yeah, there's quite a, a quite a few new legislators. So last much year. turnover. Yeah. And it's just a natural thing that flows out of people in the rest of the state. Well, Chittenden County gets all the uh, Chittenden County gets all the veggie applications. Chittenden County gets all the the HUD money. Chittenden County gets all this. Chittenden County gets all that. And the fact of the matter is, the rest of the state hasn't even recovered from the recession in the late 2000s. And if it wasn't for Chittenden County generating the resources, we'd all be a lot poorer and dividing up a much smaller pie. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Any other thoughts? Um, and um, I'll, I'm working on a presentation. I'll um, share it at least with the exec committee. Uh, we we don't have a meeting before before the breakfast, but I'll um, share with the exec committee members to take uh, a look at before that that morning. Um, even though we can't have a meeting, but um, hopefully that will work. Charlie, I'm thinking that that part is contextual. Yeah, it's just as a context, you need just need to know this is our this is our county, this is the region, this is what it contributes. It's disproportionately large, and we cannot forget that. And we have to have our representatives who are down there representing us make sure that they at least push back somewhat when these things yep. come up. It yeah, comes and up I know all the. Yeah, and at least for the things that we're involved with, like the transportation funding and you know things like that, it's actually, I think it's, there's kind of a PR issue, right? Like when there's a project in Chittenden County, it ends up in the media, but we don't actually get more than our fair share. Like we're not getting more than twenty five percent of you know transportation funding here. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I'll yeah I'll try to work on that. At least provide that context. It's a good point. And Emma's reminding folks to register for the legislative breakfast if you haven't. Thank you, Emma. And did I miss another comment there? No. Okay. Um, yeah, Taylor was just reminding me that we have data in the SEDS that we can use to uh, make that point, Jeff. Any other thoughts for the breakfast? We did, we did ask a bunch of legislators about doing a different time of day. So apologies uh, for doing first thing in the morning, but it was, it was pretty overwhelming response from the legislators. And I think it's just, they don't have other things scheduled at that time. So it turned out to be the easiest or best time for them, uh, or at least the ones that responded. Um, we will try to make a little um, more of a push. Uh, Chris heads up. Um, it seemed to, we got a little better response when we did um, letters that actually got mailed to them. So probably going to ask you to sign some letters to go out to them. Not a problem. Uh, yeah. You know, it would be great. And especially, uh, you know, if you can uh, fill the room, it was a good venue. Uh, I, we aren't meeting yeah. on the 20th. Yeah, yeah, the website uh, for CCRPC, the front page says there's a meeting, but then when you drill down on it, it says no meeting on December 20th. So this ah. is our next meeting is the breakfast uh, on Tuesday morning. 
and that's then right. we jump until uh, January 17th. That's right. So, okay. Yep. And uh, Emma just caught that and uh, she'll uh, update that calendar. I saw mm-hmm. her. <laughs> She's probably already <laughs> doing it. Um, well, it's only on the face page, you know. <laughs> and then so. I do have um, one other topic uh, to get your feedback. Um, there's another RPC, uh, Two Rivers out of Quichi, um, which is in the White River Junction area. They are involved in uh, some litigation around Act 250 and um, particularly one criterion, 9L, uh, which is kind of the strip development uh, criterion. And they're in litigation and the, um, I guess the, uh, I don't know, I don't know who's the appellant, frankly, at this point, but, um, (laughs) but the, I'll say the developers, uh, Council is kind of arguing that 9L should not even really be a criterion. Um, you know, it's uh, too vague. Um, and so it would kind of uh, really take one of the tools out of the toolbox in terms of uh, regulating development and trying to prevent uh, sprawl and strip development, or at least discourage it. Um, they're asking if uh, at no cost to us, whether we would be willing to kind of sign on in support of their legal position in that. So sorry to not have sent you anything, but I just got this request a couple of days ago uh, verbally. And um, and I guess I got an email, um, but do people, does anybody have an objection to us saying, yeah, you should try to preserve um, the uh, authority that's in 9L there? I do. Um, you, you think we should not support that? No, I think it, the existing language, sh- I mean, it should be supported. Okay. And I was involved early on in this project and testimony before the Act 250 Commission. And I think, I think that the town has appealed the District Commission's decision. I think yeah, I'm not sure if it's a town or an applicant. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's very nuanced, and I don't, I don't want to get into the legal arguments because, I mean, I we would just circle around. But um, if you're okay, we'll just at least um, add our name as supporting what uh, Two Rivers is doing. Or if there's no no objection. Okay. Thank you for that. Then, Chris, that's all I have for my report. And thank you for that uh, feedback. I appreciate it. Well, great. And uh, as I said, our next meeting is the December 5th breakfast. And uh, then we jump to January 17th. They won't be at the 5th. So um, you'll see item 11. All your committee liaison activities and reports are in your packet. Uh, Other than that, I will ask for a move to adjourn. Garrett, thank you. And a second. Thank you, Jeff. And then I will bid you all happy holidays, and I will hope to see happy you in January. Happy, Thanksgiving. Yeah. happy holidays, everyone. Hope to see you at the breakfast. Thank you. All right. All right. Good night. <laughs>